The former Prime Minister Paul Keating has been invited to meet China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi this week, potentially overshadowing the Albanese government's diplomatic plans. Mr Wang is holding the China-Australia Foreign and Strategic Dialogue alongside the Foreign Minister Penny Wong in Canberra and is also scheduled to meet with the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. For more analysis, let's bring in Greg Sheridan, the Foreign Editor at The Australian Newspaper. Greg, good to see you. Thanks for your time. What do you think? Should Mr Keating be going Glad ahead be with, you, with the meeting? Well, I noticed that uh, Keating has rather bizarrely claimed today that he has always supported Penny Wong's stabilisation. So, you know, he last week said she, you know, was putting on her frown face and beating the China threat drum. And before that, he said she didn't even do foreign policy. She just wandered around the South Pacific with a lay around her neck and a checkbook in her hand. Uh, I don't think a former prime minister should try to undermine current government on matters of national security. And I think the Chinese are deliberately humiliating the Albanese government because they've chosen the most vicious and abusive and contemptuous critic of government policy in Australia in order to magnify his position. They're doing this to divide the Labor Party and to put pressure on the Albanese government from the left, from the past, if you like, so that it won't ever speak up uh, in any way disobliging to China. I think it's ruthless and contemptuous of the Chinese government and it's kind of pathetic of uh, Paul Keating. You know, Keating hasn't had a classified briefing for a quarter of a century. He's he's on no one's priority list, but um, the Chinese foreign minister will go out of his way to see him purely to put pressure on the Albanese government and it's, it's a bad thing that Mr Keating is complicit in this Chinese coercion. Well, speaking of former Prime Ministers, the former UK PM, David Cameron, will be in Australia this week. He's in Adelaide for his new role of the, the so-called Orkman Talks. Of course, in Adelaide, it's going to be all about AUKUS submarines. You wrote in The Australian Today that the AUKUS partners, and I'll quote here, are themselves by their own actions reducing AUKUS to fantasy and symbolism. How so? Well, uh, if, if uh, Britain's going to move to its next generation of nuclear subs and Australia is going to acquire nuclear subs for the first time ever, then both nations need to increase defence spending. Both nations have, in fact, been decreasing defence spending. They increase it by a tiny nominal amount, but not enough to keep up with inflation. Australia has already retired one of our Anzac frigates and we're about to retire a second. And we're not going to replace them. We don't get the first light replacement, uh, light frigate replacement until 2030. We don't even move back to where we are in the current number of frigates until 2032. In Britain, when the Conservatives came into office, the British Army was 102,000. It's now aiming to be 72,000. In the United States, uh, Joe Biden's increasing the defence budget by a nominal 1%, which is a massive decrease after inflation and also with a pay rise for all uniformed officers, and also he's cut the nuclear submarine orders from two per year to one per year. Now, what the what that all adds up to, sorry to give you that recital, but it's important to add uh, anchor this in facts, what that adds up to is the three AUKUS partners all being uh, at a governmental level unwilling to increase their defence capabilities while they talk about AUKUS in theory, it's been going for a few years now. It hasn't delivered a single weapons system and it won't deliver all these nuclear subs unless the industrial capacity of all three countries rises massively. And all three countries are promising to do that over the horizon, you know, beyond the next few years of expenditure. But the only thing they control is the next few years of expenditure. So what they do is much more important than what they say. Yeah, plenty in the diplomatic sphere here in Australia to be watching this week on those few fronts. I did want to ask you also, Greg, further afield, I was interested to read your piece over the weekend about, well, really the degradation of the relationship between Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. It is looking increasingly unhealthy. Uh, it is. I think Biden has been under a lot of pressure uh, from the left wing of his party for his support of Israel. And Netanyahu is an unpopular prime minister within Israel and doesn't seem to have a clear plan for what happens in Gaza after the military operation is over. The Israelis feel they will need to conduct an operation at some point in the southern Gaza city of Rafah because there are maybe 
um, six six uh, six thousand or more Hamas fighters there, probably more than that, and still a huge network of tunnels. Um, at the same time, there's a very intense negotiation for a ceasefire. Now, Netanyahu may be threatening an imminent Rafah operation in order to pressure Hamas into a ceasefire, but uh, Biden has made clear he doesn't want Israel to do a Rafah uh, operation unless it can have a very big humanitarian operation, and the humanitarian situation in Gaza is unacceptable. So, uh, but mind you, Biden is 81, Netanyahu is 74. They've each been in professional politics for the whole of my professional life in journalism, and they're very pragmatic. And if they can get a ceasefire, I think they'll become, um, they go back to being on OK terms, but they don't like each other very much, and um, they've got big differences of policy uh, to negotiate right now. Greg Sheridan, always appreciate your analysis. Thanks for joining us.